Praise the Lord and welcome to another weekly broadcast of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International's weekly broadcast. With Pastor William Whitfield, our senior pastor and founder, let us now go into the Word of the Lord together. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield coming to you on this Sunday, August 25th, 2013, thanking you, as always, for tuning in and watching us on social media. We hope and pray, as always, that you had a blessed week in the Lord and that the Lord has dealt marvelously with you as you spent time with him, not only in prayer, but also in the word of the Lord. So today we're going to be talking about joy or the joy of the Lord. Amen. So today is going to be a message that is really hope to invigorate you and also to encourage you to find joy and happiness and peace in your life. As always, before we go into the word of the Lord, let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for your people, for your time. We thank you for your word, which is truly blessed and a blessing unto our lives and our walk and our relationship with you. God, we pray that you send the anointing that makes teaching as well as preaching easy. God, anoint me afresh that I may be able to reveal unto your people that which you're saying unto us. And God, anoint the ears of your people that they might hear and receive and that they might benefit from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, the word of the Lord. Today we're going to be talking about the joy of the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, as always, I please ask that you always have them handy so that as we go through the word of the Lord together, you might see for yourself exactly what the word of the Lord is saying. We're going to extract one verse from Nehemiah, the 8th chapter and the 10th verse. We're also going to be looking at Isaiah, the 12th chapter and the 3rd verse. And if time permits, we're going to be going to Psalms, the 98th chapter. So if we don't have time to get to the 98th chapter of Psalms, I'm asking that you would read that in your private time as a part of this message that you're hearing today. Amen. So let us, without further ado, read Nehemiah, the 8th chapter and the 10th verse, and it says this. This is Nehemiah speaking to the children of Israel. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them from whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And also Isaiah the twelfth chapter and the third verse, it reads as follows Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the well of salvation. Amen. And today again we're going to be talking about joy. So Joy is basically a noun. I love to give the definition of things because I don't want to assume that everybody knows what we're talking about and nor do we are nor are we looking to insult anyone's intelligence. But we also want to make sure that everybody is clear and on the same sheet of music. So the noun, first of all, means great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying or gives an elation to your soul and your view and how you're looking at it to the point that you become so overwhelmed with happiness and with joy where misery and all the negativity is dissipated or done away with or removed from your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit, whether it's perpetually or whether it's momentarily. But joy should be something that is on the inside of each and every one of our hearts and our spirits. But a lot of times, through the circumstances of life, joy can be taken away from us or we can be zapped of our strength of joy. But one thing about a joyous person that I recognize and realize is that you can never beat down a person who is full of joy, who is full of happiness, who has already made up in their mind that they're not going to allow life to beat them down to a certain degree. And even if they feel as though that they're being dragged down by the circumstances that are around them or that they're involved in, they have concluded in their mind, they have made a conscious 
decision that they're not going to allow this circumstance to overwhelm them. And most people that I know that really are joyful when they see that a devastating situation has come upon them, they actually set it as a goal that they will allow themselves to mourn and grieve over this for a specified period of time. And after that period of time, that they're going to bounce back because they know within their hearts and within their minds that the joy of the Lord is their strength. And that's one of the things that even we as Christians must keep in our forefront, in our mind. That God gives us joy. The service towards God gives us joy. And what we do in life gives us joy. And most of the time, me people look at Christianity as being this whole hum type of a thing. And truth of the matter is, you can experience full joy in the Lord just by your servitude to the Lord himself. Stay tuned with us for there's more in the word of the Lord to bless your soul and to refresh you for all eternity. And too many times when people look at Christianity, they look at it as though it is something where we should live in a pious bubble. And separate and that we can have fun and that we cannot have joy. And most of the time you'll see some Christians whose faces are broke down to look so deep and so holy and, and, and so serious. But God loves to laugh. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that laughter is like a good medicine. And it's good to have a good sense of humor. There are some friends that I love talking to or hanging out with and cutting up with. And, and even you can't tell by my demeanor, I really am pretty much a clown at heart. I love to joke and I love people to make fun. And I steer away from vicious types of jokings and things of that nature. And, and even sometimes there are friends that you can be real and down to earth with. You can let your hair down and, and really have a good time. And sometimes in Christianity that is shunned. But God is a God of joy. He is a God of elation and he takes great delight and great joy in his people and his servants that are living according to his standards and his word. And those that know how to bring a joyousness into his heart. God is not sitting on his throne looking down at humanity, pointing his finger, willing to judge. That's why we have to be so careful about the people whom we judge, regardless of whether we are proving of their lifestyles or not. My thing is this, as long as they're living and breathing, God has opportunity to turn their situation and life around. So regardless of what sin they may be involved in, it gives God great pleasure and joy to bring a soul to salvation. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices over the salvation of one soul. That all of heaven rejoices when one soul has turned from a life of sin and ungodliness and have embraced in the principles of God and has come to the understanding that God is Lord of all and that he has now placed them on a divine path to change their lives significantly based upon his word and their relationship with him. So even when people come into salvation, there should be a great rejoicing even amongst us that are saved and born again believers. We should be overwhelmed with joy, overcome with joy to the point that it generates reactions out of our lives, out of our spirits, and out of our hearts, that we rejoice with heaven, that we open up our mouths and we give God praise, that we go to dancing, even in our bodies, even though we look upon dancing as being a secular thing, 
But if you read the scripture, when David came back into Jerusalem, even after defeating the Philistines and after having successfully brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem to his true resting place, you'll find out that there was great celebration along with timbrels and dancing and singing. Even when Moses delivered the people of the children of Israel by the mighty hand of God, when they came through the Red Sea, and God allowed the Red Sea to encapsulate their enemies to de destroy them. That there was great dancing and rejoicing with Miriam who led the women and their son singing that the, rider and the horse and his rider has been drowned in the sea. So there is great time for dancing and jubilation and joy. In the kingdom of God, every message that we preach is not a message of judgment, not a message of damnation, not a message of correction. But there is some time that God wants the joy of the Lord to be exuded, even in the congregation of the righteous, where we sing a new song unto the Lord and we are giving God something new out of our hearts and out of our soul. And a lot of times when we meet pure joy with the pure joy of heaven, there is a divine connection that takes place in the earth realm with the heavenly realm. And God comes into our sanctuaries and is invited in the midst of our jubilation because he wants us to understand that he is a God that is a joyful God. God is full of happiness. He is full of contentment. He is full of peace. He is full of understanding. He is full of mercy. And God loves to have his ego stroked by the joy and the rejoicing that comes out of the people's hearts. He also loves those that have a glad heart. And a happy heart. He loves those that are focused upon him. And their happiness is established fully in him. Not in things. Not in what people have done or have not done. Regardless of what they have or may have lost. He wants us to know that are you going to be joyful just because you have substance? Or are you going to be joyful because you have me? And have me wholeheartedly. The beginning of pure joy is the grasping and the apprehending and the holding on to God himself. When you have God, you have everything. The Bible says that in the beginning was God and God created everything that there was. And without him was nothing made. Everything comes from God. And in God is the fullness of joy. And peace and happiness, both now and forevermore. The thing is, do you want the fullness of God's joy? Then you must learn to embrace God fully and completely because there is no contentment or satisfaction outside of Him. Joy is also the expression or display of a feeling, of a glad feeling. It's a festive gaiety. It's a state of happiness or felicity. It is a place to feel joy, be glad, and to rejoice. It's also to be gladdened, which is an obsolete word, but it also means to be gladdened. This is the place where you feel rapture. Rapture means to be taken up, taken up into a place out of your unhappiness. It is a place where you leap up out of your place. There's a, the stating about Superman. He's able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. There's a gentleman that I was watching who had a unique talent that he could jump, uh, I believe it was like nine feet or so, and he jumped upon an object and stood upon it. There are times that you're going to have to be so joyous even in the midst of devastation. That you're going to have to leap up out of your situation and you're going to have to leap up out of it so high that you're going to have to stand upon it and let it know that I, you're not going to rule me, but I'm going to dominate you. And even on the beginning of this year, I shared with several people how I had gone through something extremely devastating, but I gave myself 
40 days, 45 days to change my mind and change my mentality. And beyond that, I refuse to allow it to dominate or control my psyche or my emotions or how I would interact in my profession and in my ministry and with people. I chose to take the high road. And within less than 40 days, I had come up out of that pit by prayer and by fasting and believing God and fiercely praying to God that he, that he would deliver my mentality that this devastating thing would not have control over me. And even when I began talking to my friends and, and different ones that saw me had no clue. And that even one person, uh, even more so recently said, you don't even, a couple of people actually said, you don't even look like you're even in a situation of devastation. But the thing is this, friend, it's a choice to either be saddened and it's a choice to come out. And it's a choice to be joyful. Because if you understand as Isaiah the third chapter says, the, the 12th chapter and the third verse says, it says, therefore shall we draw, shall therefore with joy shall we draw waters out of the out of the well of salvation. Salvation means that God is going to rescue me and I'm going to go to the well of joy because in that well lies, lies salvation, rescue, victory, honor, strength, and authority to get up out of this. You have authority to speak to your atmosphere and all those that had breached your atmosphere in your home that brings negativity, that brings trouble, that brings difficulty. You, by the divine will of the Father, God himself, in the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, you have the ability to speak to it. Going back to Nehemiah the 8th chapter, in the 10th verse, if you understand the book of Nehemiah, let me break it down and give you a little history here. Nehemiah was the king's of uh, the Babylonian king's cupbearer. And he was pouring the king's drink and the king noticed the sadness in his countenance. And there's a lot of times when we're sad, it shows in our facial expressions. It shows in our eyes. It shows and is heard in our level of communication. It's heard in our perception of what people is say, are saying to us. It's understood even in our body posture and our body language, how poorly we're walking, how erect we're sitting, how slumped over we are, how we're leaning, our arms folded, and that spirit of indifference that is on our face, even how we handle people and are rude to people. We can tell when people are in a place, but you can make a conscious decision that I'm not going to allow this circumstance to be my Lord, to rule over me. Because there is a greater thing coming for me than anything that I can see. And a lot of times, you don't even have to be able to or pick up in people's body posture or their language. For those of us that are discernful, we could pick up even in the atmosphere. Let me tell you, as a pastor, as a preacher... I've been preaching for many years now, but even many times that I preach messages or had to open up service or even or, uh, different things in ministry, you could feel the weightiness and the heaviness of the burdens that people are carrying. And sometimes you have to preach and plow through the atmosphere because it is so thick of troubles and negativities and despondency and distresses and people that are fearful of their life circumstances. And then we have to plow through the atmosphere. Either we have to stop and minister to the people to break that spirit of heaviness, whether individually, or exalt people to trust in God through the word of the Lord or through prayer in the atmosphere by binding the enemy, by binding that spirit and loosing the blessings of God and to free the atmosphere. Or sometimes God will just have us to preach through it, to plow through the atmosphere because the word that he has given for that day was designed to break up and destroy what the enemy was trying to bring 
into the atmosphere. And a lot of times, too many people stay at home when they're going through emotionally, when they're going through a season of difficulties. And that is not the time to stay away from the household of faith. That is the time where you should run to the household of faith. Because there you will find the joy of the Lord and will hear the word. If you're believing the man or the woman of God to be sensitive to the spirit of God, they will have a word in season to break and destroy the bands and the yokes of the enemy through the word of God. The whole purpose of why we labor for God and stay before God in prayer is this. So that we could be in tune with the one that knows everything. Especially those that are under our care and under our tutelage. Because we want to make sure that the word that we're declaring into the lives of the people is relevant for where they are. And where they are when God gives us a word in the seasons of your lives, where you are. That is the power and authority to know that God is concerned about you, that he cares about you, and that he is going to bring victory into your life. Because God just just doesn't speak just to speak. He speaks because there is a need to be met. And the need exists in you. If you would but understand that this is the will of your Father concerning you. In With joy Christ, ye shall draw waters from the wells of salvation. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Never allow the enemy to take your joy away from you. Stay tuned. There's more in God, store. through the joy of the Lord, is trying to combat misery in you, unhappiness in you, sorrow and grief. In you, what he wants you to understand that there is an amusement. <laughs> this is like amusement when you go to an amusement park or you watch something funny. He is trying to tell you that what the devil is trying to do is cause you to be broken. But what he wants you to do is find amusement <laughs> in the midst of your difficult situation. He wants you to find amusement in the enemy's face that it will confound him when you can go to rejoicing in the Lord because of what you're going through, despite of what you're going through. When you can give joyful statements and when you can bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me, bless his worthy name, his mighty name, his magnificent name, his awesome name, his name that is above every name. Because when you begin to lift up the name of Jesus, the Bible said that at the name of Jesus, every tongue in heaven and earth shall confess and every knee shall bow at the authority of Jesus Christ. When he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. That not only means, that means that he will draw all men. Men mean strength in the Bible. We always look at it as salvation. He is talking about salvation. But he's also talking about drawing those around you that have the strength of the Lord. That will uplift your arms in prayer. That will uplift your arms in strength. And will not allow you to put your arms down until victory has been had. That's the lesson why Moses had Aaron and her hold up his arms. As long as his arms were upheld, the children of Israel were victorious in battle. As soon as his arms began to decline and come down, they began to lose. You need someone of joy to hold up your arms. And you need the joy of the Lord to lift you up out of the valley of despair, out of the valley of despondency, out of the valley of trouble. Let me tell you, trouble may not leave, but you have a way of looking at life completely differently. That trouble, you understand that trouble don't last always. Trouble has a season, and my victory praise is not in the season after the trouble has left. But in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the battle, I'm going to shout now because I know that victory is mine. 
Friends, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can pull strength from the Lord in times of difficulty. Let me go back into Nehemiah. Nehemiah, who was before the king, the king recognized the sadness of his countenance. And the king gave a request, asked the question, what is it going on? Because this is but sadness of a heart deep on the inside. Nehemiah was upset and concerned because he had just recently received a report from Jerusalem that the walls of the city had been broached and breached and torn down, that the city lied in disrepair, and there was no one that was taking the lead to repair the walls in the city. So he asked, answered the king and gave a request of the king that he might be able to go back to Jerusalem with letters to get materials and supplies from the king's kingdom and from those that supplied the king with his supplies so that he could go back and rebuild Jerusalem, the city of God, the place that he loved. And because of it, they came back to Jerusalem, Nehemiah, and he went through the city and saw how despairing it was. And it really rocked him at his very core that he was moved to action. The thing is, even in the midst of disparity, take your travel, see how devastating it is. See the reality of what it really is. Faith is not the absence of you not realizing what is real and what is actually at hand and what's at stake or what's at risk. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, that this can be changed that this can be worked out, that this can be rebuilt, and that God can supply everything that is needed to get me on the course to be to rebuild. You and joyfulness helps you to see with the eyes of faith beyond the day that you are seeing the devastation in, and it allows you to see in the day when everything is back in sync and in order as it should be for your life and for the lives of those that are involved. So Nehemiah took his journey to Jerusalem and he viewed the city and he came up with a plan. He came with a plan. He didn't develop a plan before he got there. His plan was already laid when his heart was sad before the king. He articulated and expressed well what he needed in order to rebuild his city. He went through the city to see how devastating it was, to see what was needful to rebuild it. He looked at the scorched stones and the walls and realized that these stones can be used again. And you've got to understand that even in the midst of your devastation, I don't care how scorched or burned or how torn down you are, God is able to replenish you where you're needing it. And he's able to cleanse you and to reuse you for the kingdom. Some of you have lacked your joy because you think that you will never be used by the kingdom of God again. The devil is a liar. As a matter of fact, the circumstances that you just came through that even gave you that thought process, God designed it for you to go through it so that you will come out of it with exceeding joy. That you now will understand your true purpose in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and that you yourself would walk in it without hesitation, without any reluctancy, because through this thing you will see the need of others, and that you will come into a place, and that you will be the amusement of God to bring the feet in his face. God will use you and your circumstances as his playground to bring others in so that they too can experience the joy of the Lord. Now, Nehemiah is back in Jerusalem. Ezra and a, and a group of other people come. And they find the law of the Lord. And in Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, listen, the people of God in verse 1 acts, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man. They had one heart, one man, into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. 
And Nazar the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, and from the, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could hear and understand, and the ears and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So here the people asked that the book be brought out. And they asked to hear, and they stood from morning unto midday before them. And listen, verse 5, I'm going to skip down. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, because they had built a pulpit for him to stand or, or stage above the people. And in this day, this was good because of the audibility of it, so that people can hear it, the acoustics. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened the book, listen, all the people stood up. This is where we honor the word of the Lord in our churches. This is where it comes from. When the word of the Lord is read, that we stand in honor of the word, our receptivity. It says that I'm going to receive the word with my full attention. And I'm not going to disrespect the Lord by sitting down on the king who is speaking through his word. Amen. And that's what bless the people of God. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. But I want to go back to verse 3, the latter part of that. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the Lord, of the law. They wanted to hear the word of the Lord. And because of this, after they heard it, they began to weep and cry. And they had to still the people by saying, Then he said unto them in verse 10, Go your way, listen, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send, and send portions unto them, for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy, this day is hallowed, this day is sacred. Because you were willing to stand and hear and reverence and obey and desire us and crave and had a, had a curiosity about what God was saying to his people. And because of this, this day, because you had it in your heart to hear what God was saying. He says, now today is a joyous day unto the Lord. This is a holy, sanctified, anointed day unto the Lord. I don't want you to sit in fear. I don't want you to sit crying. I don't want you to sit apprehensively. What I want you to do is take this in your heart. And I want you to go back and I want you to feast. I want you to have a good time. I want you to rejoice because, listen, Today, neither be ye sorrow, sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You have just drawn strength from hearing, desiring, hearing, reverencing, and realizing your faults. This is the place that God wants us all to come to. That we can acknowledge the place that we've done wrong. But yet, we're willing to make the course corrections. We're going to navigate and plot a new course. And we're going to navigate it. And we're going to stay on this course for our lives. And we're not going to deviate from it. We're not going to allow circumstances to come our way. But in the face of difficulty, what you need to do is find a new approach, a new strategy. Sometimes that strategy may mean that even in the midst of your difficulties, and especially when it's financially, that you take out your bills and your wallet and you begin to walk over it and dance over it and say, the Lord will supply all my needs. And you mean it, speaking those things that aren't 
as though they are. My son and my daughter will receive salvation. I'm going to receive the fullness of joy. My morning is going to be turned into dancing. And I'm going to dance the victory. Why? Because it's an act of faith. And the acts of faith warns that I do something that I've not done before. And this must mean that I must do it. And I must do it with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my might, with nothing doubting or wavering. When you come into that place that you can overpower your ways of thinking to become his ways of thinking. And you begin to look at life completely differently. Not because of your age, but because of who your God is. And the thing is, because God is who he says he is, I can prove him at his words. Many times we don't put God to the test because we have been taught that you don't challenge God, that you don't question God, and that you don't put God to the test. But when he says in Malachi, prove me and see will I not open to you the windows of heaven, so much so that I will pour you out a blessing, that I will open up the windows of heaven. I will give you blessings in such a way that you won't even have capacity enough to receive. We must learn to put God to the test, not perversely, but according to what he has said in his word. And we will find the joy of the Lord. The only thing that I'm asking God for is not materialistic things. Yes, there are some materialistic things that I would love to have. I would love to be wealthy, but I'd rather be happy and content on the inside of my soul and have the peace and the love and the joy of God than to have something that he has never wanted me to have or you. Join us now for the conclusion of today's word with Pastor William Whitfield, Senior Pastor, Faith Hope Love Ministries, and Retreat Services International. Now what does joy mean? Joy means amusement, bliss. It could mean charm. It could mean cheer. It could mean comfort. It could mean delight, elation, glee, humor, pride, satisfaction, alleviation, animation, which we already talked about, delectation, Diversion, ecstasy, exaltating, exaltation, felicity, felicity, festivity, frolic, fruition, gaiety, gl gem, gladness, gratification, hilarity, indulgence, jewels, jubilation, liveliness, luxury, merriment, merit. Prize, rapture, ravenous, refreshment. And a lot of times, we just need to be refreshed in our spirits. And when God refreshes us, we can come into a new place. Sometimes refreshment, when you come out of a desert of experience, you just want God to bless you. Now listen, there are some words that are equating to happiness or joy. Because I really want you to get this in your spirit today. Because God wants to infuse you with joy. He wants to give you an IV that is tapped directly into your bloodstream. Your life being infused with his life. So that you can get immediate joy. Immediate joy. I'm talking about a joy that surpasses your inabilities to action or to do or to function. I'm talking about infusing you with such a joy that when you finish being infused, that nothing that comes your way, the devil himself could present his very presence and image in your room. But your joy will make you like that mold, that penicillin in a petri dish. That when you look and when he tries to press in on you, he can only go but so far. He can't even touch you because the joy of the Lord, let me tell you, the joy of the Lord is so strong. Listen to me. 
that a person that is so full of the joy of the Lord Jesus was filled with the joy of the Lord. And it says, for the joy of the Lord that was set before him, he knew that the joy, that God was going to get joy out of his sacrifice. That even for the joy of the Lord that was set before him, when the devil thought that he had him, it was that joy that broke his power and his back and his authority over humanity. Let me tell you, if you were to gain the joy of the Lord, you would be able to defeat all of your adversaries. Not one of them would be able to stand before you because joy would keep everything from around you. It would keep attacks from surmounting itself against you and you would be just like that mole needing to be refined into penicillin. But yet, it has all the power to back it up. And if you understand how powerful joy is, Nehemiah built Jerusalem with joy. And even when his adversaries came, Sanballat and all the rest of those that were with him that wanted to stop the work of the Lord on the house of God and the temple of God, his joy was so deep that he was in a place that he could rebuild built for God that he made these words clear I will not come down from this wall you do not have part in rebuilding this house but I'm going to stay here because I found joy and satisfaction in rebuilding the house of the Lord and I'm going to stand here with an amusement of pride knowing that you're upset Knowing that you want to destroy the work of the Lord and that your intents are evil and that you only want me to come down so that you yourself can destroy the work and hinder it and cease it from going forward. When you find joy, you will upset every single enemy that comes your way. When you have peace in your heart and people are arguing and all this confusion is going on around you, but you have peace and joy in your heart. You're sitting there with a smile, not a smirk, but a smile from the depths of your soul that is so overwhelmingly happy that even when people see you, they're going to think that you lost your mind. Do they really understand what's going on here? Do they understand what I'm about to do to them? Do they understand how devastating this situation is, can be? But you're sitting there. It's going to be okay. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You are seen as a source of ridiculousness. And you're seen as a source of peacefulness. It's based upon the perception of those that are viewing you to understand in their level of knowledge of what's going on. Yes, calm your soul down. Peace, be still. Because joy has stepped into the room. Joy, justification of overcoming your circumstances. You've got to understand that joy causes you to be an overcomer and not to be defeated. Joy is the thing that's going to bring you out when you begin to joyfully accept and embrace your circumstances, knowing that this thing I've got the victory over. And when you have the victory over your circumstances by your mentality, even when it's approaching, even when it's in the thick of it, and you know because of joy you're coming out of it. You can look at things and wear things with a loose garment. You can look at people arguing at you and don't even respond in like fashion and just say, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay because I've got a peace about this situation. And that's what the enemy hates. Also in 1 Chronicles 29 and 9, it says, Then the people rejoice for that they offered willingly because, willingly because with a perfect heart, they offered willingly unto the Lord. 
and listen because they offered willingly with a perfect heart. They offered willingly to the Lord and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. This here means blissomeness or glee from in a religious festivity or festival. It means to be exceedingly joyous, joyful or joyfulness or merit or pleasure with rejoicing with the mouth is what Joy means here in 1 Chronicles 29 and 9. In Ezra 6 and 16, it also means joy. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God, listen, with joy. Remember, Ezra is working with Nehemiah. And when the house of God is fully finished, I can only but imagine seeing something that was very devastating, ruined and destroyed, and those that may have seen the former glory of the house of God now have seen it re-erected, refurbished, rebuilt, reconstructed, and now they're rejoicing that they have a place to go to celebrate their God, their God who has brought them back from being captives as a result of the ill that their forefathers had done. Now they're back in their homeland. And Israel is rejoicing. Can you imagine how God would bless you. If you would but learn to rejoice in his presence. Now we're nowhere near finished this message on today. And I do feel the Holy Spirit lifting. But I want to share this, and, and we'll go back into this word on this coming Wednesday for our Wednesday night segment in the word. But you, friends, listen to me. You must find the joy of the Lord for your life. Because everything that comes your way, you're living in a state of perpetual sadness. A perpetual state of despondency. A perpetual state where some of you are even suicidal and even spiritually suicidal. I don't care how many people are around you or have rejected you. I don't care about the level of your sadness or the degree that God cannot heal it is what I mean. I am concerned about you. But God is able to do exceedingly above anything that we can ever think or imagine. If you would but trust. I want you to find joy. In serving God. I want you to find joy. That your life has a divine purpose. God does not. Make mistakes. You're just not here by circumstances or chance. You're here because there is a real purpose. For your existence. Regardless of what you have and your experience. God wants to bless you so much so that you can find joy in helping others come out of similar situations. When you find the joy of the Lord and his strength for your life. Today is a day for you to rejoice. Don't be sad within your heart. Don't weep. Don't moan. Don't cry. Because today, if you're watching this message, you are craving and desiring change in your life. You're desiring the word of the Lord to be victorious over your life. And the banner of the Lord over your life will be love. Because he loves you with an everlasting love. Get out of the place of despondency that you're in. That's not where God wants you. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for those that are watching. I thank you for those that have viewed this message. And God, today I want the joy, your joy, to overshadow them, overwhelm them with your love. Overwhelm them with your joy, your peace, your contentment. Your satisfaction. Break the bonds of the enemy over their lives. Break the yoke of the enemy. Make them, as I've already mentioned, as that mole 
that thing that was ugly, that thing that was unsightful, that thing that everyone rejected. But in the midst of that petri dish, something transpired and something happened. Every disease that would bring death was repelled. Every microscopic organism of harm, of destruction, was repelled. And that thing that was ugly became a thing of beauty to bring healthiness and wholeness into others' lives and even its municipal value. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, make their ugly circumstances into a thing of beauty that they can see how joyous it has been or was to go through such a negative thing. God, we thank you for each and every one of those that have watched and those that have received this prayer and you're going to move upon. Now, Father, for those that aren't saved and those that you aren't, I pray that you come to salvation. I pray that you find a resting place to rest your soul at, a household of faith where the man or the woman of God preaches divine truths, that you would submit and avail yourself to learn and to be taught and to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ himself through them, and that you yourself in your own personal prayer time would get into the word of the Lord and study it and pray and talk to the Father commune with him just as I'm talking to you now. Prayer is not something spooky and mystic. It's something that you just have to be willing to do and to know that God hears your prayers and the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Come to know him, come into salvation and embrace him. God loves you. And so do we here at Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. If this word has been a blessing unto you, write us today. Our email address is fhlmrs12 at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Send us your prayer requests. Send us your testimonies. Send us the word that God has blessed you with so that we know how the Lord has been blessed bountifully, blessing you and yours. Until this coming Wednesday, our Wednesday Night in the Word segment, this is Pastor Whitfield thanking you for tuning in. And God bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast of Faith Hope and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International with Pastor Whitfield. Remember to join us on this coming Wednesday for our Wednesday Night Time in the Word. And again on next Sunday for our weekly broadcast of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. We are praying for you and for yours that you will gain the victory with the joy of the Lord on your side.